Benjamin, Peter, how are you doing? Very well, hi. Great, Marcus, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So welcome to today's Virtual Design Festival collaboration with Brown, the legendary industrial design brand um, from Germany. And we have two representatives or two people who are very close to the, to the brand today to discuss a really interesting topic, good design in times of change. And we're certainly going through times of dramatic change at the moment. And what we're going to do in this talk is explore how design has responded to previous upheavals in human society. I have Benjamin Wilson, who's a designer at Brown. Hi, Benjamin. Good afternoon, sir. And I have Peter Kapos, who's a curator and an expert on the brand. Hi there, Peter. Hello, hi. Could you first of all, to start off with, both tell us a little bit more about yourself. So Benjamin, tell us who you are, what you do, and, and where are you? Where are you calling in from? Um, well, Benjamin Wilson's my name. Uh, I'm originally born in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, been in Germany now for almost 20 years, 18 to be honest. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be calling you today from my literally my living room uh, due to some of those moments of change we're currently going through. Uh, as of 10 minutes ago, my children were playing uh, on the, on the, the foosball table there behind me. And uh, this is sort of my, my little uh, haven at the moment to continue on with business and, and, and still uh, do the job uh, that... Uh, that I have at Brown. And I've been with Brown now for 18 years. Um, as an industrial designer, I began in 2002 and living in, in Kronberg, Germany. Uh, it's a pleasure every day to sort of wake up and have the, the opportunity to go and work on, on this fantastic brand. And, and we're gonna to touch on some of the, the reasons why it's such a fantastic brand in this call today. So I'm looking forward to that. So where exactly are you? I mean, you're in your house, but where is that? Kronberg, Germany. And which part of Germany is that? Um, near Frankfurt, so quite, quite close to the Frankfurt airport, so right in the middle in the heart of Germany. Um, Kronberg was founded in Frankfurt in 1921 and the head office and, and headquarters are based in Kronberg now and they've been there for I think since the early 60s. So looking, into your, looking at your backdrop there, I can see a bit of classic German design or a design by a German designer on the wall there, but also the football table, that looks a little bit like Homemade, perhaps? <laughs> actually, well, it's actually a cardboard cutout. You've got to build it yourself. It took me literally nine and a half hours to build it. Um, it was a great <laughs> journey teaching my kids of working with their hands. And uh, it's, it's survived two and a half years now, which is quite good. Good quality. So that's a product you can buy, is it? Like a flat pack football table? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then what's that thing hanging from the ceiling behind you? Uh, that's the cocoon of the children. Uh, that's their safe haven if they want to sit and sh shake and wobble and rotate and spin, spinny, spinny. Uh, they, uh, they love that sort of stuff. And I, are they in there at the moment being very quiet? No, I've said them, I, 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 I debated whether I want them sneaking in and smiling during the call, but actually I, I, I opted out of that. They've gone to the park. <laughs> Probably a good move. And uh, <laughs> Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Peter Kapos. Um, I'm the strategic director of System Studio, which is a London-based uh, graphic design studio. Um, I'm also a, a writer and a curator um, with a specialism in um, brand design, um, which is how Ben and I met many years ago. Um, and uh, I'm at the moment sitting in the, in the studio, which is a rare visit for me, which I quite enjoy. <laughs> I can getting down here. Um, not as often as I'd like to nowadays. Um, and you'll see around, um, there's quite a lot of um, Brown and Vitsu, um, which we have uh, quite an extensive collection of here at the studio and we use to run um, seminars. Um, and at the moment we're um, also doing some consultancy and design work for Brown. So we're sort of developing um, something of a, uh, of a partnership. And I was gonna say, I mean, it looks like you're dialing in from yeah. circa 1968. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the collection you've got around you there. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly extensive. So, I mean, we've got, um, I think, all of the important um, designs, both for, for Brown and Vitsu, focusing um, mostly on the 60s, actually. Um, so they're sort of the, that kind of very, the early, really heroic, heroic period um, when there was... Um, very extensive and uh, very coherent um, program across 
a very large number of categories. And there's something interesting about the interplay of furniture and, um, and electrical goods, because obviously Dieter Rams was, um, was deeply involved both at Vitsu and also at Brown. Um, and he was allowed to treat the two companies as if they were a single project. So the level of coherence is really extraordinary, actually. Yeah. I'm sure you saw that uh, I did an interview with Gary Hustwit, the film director. Yeah, yeah. Um, God, it was weeks ago now. Virtual Design <laughs> Festival feels like it's gone on virtually forever already. But yeah, he, he was talking about the movie he made about Dieter Rams when he was yeah. you know, um, the, the head of design at Brown. But all of the kit you've got there, do you use it? Are you, do you use the record player and the reel-to-reel -reel, or is it sort of there? No, I mean, we, the, the record player and the, and the speakers, we, we do use, actually, yeah. I mean, there's a limit to how much of it you can use <laughs> sensibly. So we've got um, one system in the room next door. We've got one system set up here. Um, most of it works, which is, um, which is quite incredible. I mean, it, it tends not to want to work, but it can be coaxed back into life with a bit of love. So, yeah. It, it's, it needs to work really, you know, otherwise there's something a little bit deathly about electrical <laughs> equipment that's inert. And how did you get into, interested in Brown in the first place? Uh, that was, um, I know, it was a long time ago now, but it was around the time when I was, I was doing a PhD in philosophy and um, I was kind of peripherally in, interested in, in industrial design. And I kind of realized that I was particularly interested in um, German idealism um, and there's a, a flowing together of ideas out of German idealism into 20th century German functionalism, which I became aware of um, and it kind of developed out of that really. Um, so I, I have a kind of a, I guess I would say a sort of philosophical interpretation of kind of, um, it's a specifically German project of thinking the whole um, and a lot of that sort of um, modernist um, German 20th century design that I'm interested in also has a social orientation. So it, it provides pictures of utopian pictures of a kind of reconciled holes, um, which I think, I mean, in terms of what we'll be discussing today is really, is my interest. It, it, it has a kind of um, speculative, futural, a kind of projection really of what a world could be like which is installed in buildings and in, in interiors and in coffee grinders, which I think is marvellous. Well, it's a very apt sentiment thinking about what the world could be like given through what we're going through at the moment. Right. Let's um, have a look at your presentations then. Benjamin, do you want to fire up yours first of all? Yeah, sure. It's very much in line, I think, with also what Peter's been touching on, the, uh, the topic of what is a period of time and what, what is that period of time mean stand for and, and, and where, where does it begin and what is, how, how do we adapt to those those moments of change i think the topic uh that we we, we discussed uh, a few weeks ago marcus was the idea of times of change and good design so i think it's also a question to, to ask ourselves but also a generation who's who's learning what design's about what is good design so if you're saying times of change and good design what does the idea of good design mean? Is it the programmatic, systematic thinking that Peter's mentioning? Uh, it's certainly a massive part of it when, when trying to create a better future um, for all of us to live. And uh, I think there's that shift. I think I'll just jump in. I've got five minutes. I've given myself five minutes time. Hopefully that's uh, enough, Marcus, to sort of give you a feeling of, of some of these thoughts. So we at Brown, obviously, we design products that are found on human need. They need to be easy to use and built to last. And we've, we've actually been doing this since 1921. The, uh, the entire collection, and, and this is my invitation to yourself, Marcus, as well as the entire design community, if you do get a chance uh, to come out to Kronberg at some stage, just near Frankfurt, about a 20 minute train ride, jump on that train, come out to Kronberg and spend a few hours in this space. We don't have a three hour, time for a three hour monologue from me about 1921 and Max Brown solving problems. Um, so it's really sort of almost an invitation to say, come out to Kronberg and experience the depth of this, 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 this history um, yourselves at some stage. That would be very, very nice to have you here. One thing that I'm, I've got, I'm on a mission myself uh, is to not just talk about the past, past or the present, but actually just as, as Peter, Peter just mentioned, in the context of the future. 
what does good design mean and what role can it play in designing a better world uh, and utilizing the, 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 the philosophy and the approach that, that Brown is renowned for um, to help achieve uh, that, that what, what, uh, what Peter's gonna talk about as well. There's a nice quote there as well from the, from the current Brown design team in Kronberg. Um, and that's just sort of some of the details of how we work today in, in, in relation to that heritage and also looking forward. But I think there's also this one moment in time that many people say this is the birth moment of, of, of when good design was born. And I like to sort of look at it as, 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 a, as a moment in time where the Brothers Brown had a choice. Do they move forward with the company in a new direction or do they keep doing the same thing their father was doing? And that's a quite an important choice. And it was founded on the idea, as Peter just mentioned, actually creating a better world. So a utopian vision of making better products that are founded on human need and that are built to last. That's, that's quite a nice vision of the future. And you can see this simple example here, both these products do the same thing. One's designed and engineered and reduced down to what matters in the sense of, uh, in, as coined in the late, late 60s, 70s, uh, the less but better uh, way of design. Um, and so that's sort of a, I like to call it the, the stake in the ground for the design community. That's when everyone say, says and agrees, this is the moment when good design was born or what, what people were no, 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 no Brown for. And what I like to talk about is that Brown design is not aesthetic, Marcus. I'm sure you'll agree. And a lot of the community who, are, who we're talking with today will also agree that Brown design is renowned for, for looking and feeling a certain way. But what's far more important is the level of thinking that leads to design becoming like a brown design object. And it's, I mean, a simple um, rendition of it. It's about making things that are useful, that people need, make sure they're easy to use slash simple and ensure they're built to last. An example of that, this is uh, the 1955 exhibition stand. And this is actually a, a picture from when Peter uh, did his, presented his doctor, doctorate in 2016. And we installed two of these units. These elements are from 1955, Marcus. We took them out of the cupboard, dusted them off, set them up into a beautiful Raven Row space, and Peter presented his, his doctorate uh, in, in all its glory. And we still have that entire <laughs> unit, the 1955 exhibition stand, is still being stored by a man called Jürgen in Berlin. And literally those shelves you see on the top left-hand side here are fill, filled with exactly the unit from 1955. So it's was designed to be used, it was designed to be simple to ascend, assemble, and it was designed and built to last because it can be, still be set up today. Um, what about, I mentioned the mission I'm on. The mission I'm on is to also make sure people understand what leads to brown design, Marcus. If you look at these two objects, how, how many years do you think between these two products? Quick question for you. Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, one year. Well done. It's literally 12 months, 12 months turnaround from the moment they decided to reduce. Well done. You're actually the first person. I've asked this to several people, people like David Fisher from High Snobiety, Virgil Abloh uh, in a discussion earlier in the year. I said, how many months or years or whatever between these? They sometimes say 10, 15 years. So it was, it was a choice to reduce this product. I knew, down. I knew it was a trick question and you've got <laughs> well, the go. wrong way yeah. as well, chronologically. That's what, this is actually a photo from Peter, just to sort of say, Peter, we've, we've spoken about this, we need to switch them around, okay? For Japan, it works, Mark, Marcus, okay? For Japan, it works. Japanese market, that's for sure. They read from the right to the left. Anyway. Um, so that, that's a sort of one of those, those moments in time where you can literally see that it's not just about an aesthetic, it's about a level of reduction, reducing parts, taking away the golden bits, reducing the graphic, changing the, the, the way the strap connects to the body. It's, a, it's an, a subtractive process that led to this object becoming what it is. Right, Benjamin, can I ask a question? Are they, are they essentially the same product with a different box or is the technology inside also different? The technology was upgraded subtly. I mean, obviously lots of tube technologies and ways of, of actually making these radios work. Um, it was actually a borrowed technology from another company in, in the Brown Exporter and it was reinterpreted and manufactured in Germany. Uh, and this, this one is an evolution of it. So it's like an iPhone with upgrade software, quicker capacitor or smaller capacitors. But yeah, technically very, very, very much uh, the same product, but one has been designed with a simple mentality and a way of doing things. And one was simply created by a bunch of engineers. I, 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 I'll say that. So leading up to where we are today, I've got two more minutes to shoot through four or five slides. I think, 
the mission for us is not just to preach the converted, Marcus, and that's again why I love the idea of this format and this talk we're doing and listening to Gary Hustwit talk about his film. It's about reaching people who don't have the level of understanding of what good design is, like yourself, Peter, and myself sitting in this call. I'd say we're experts in our, in our, in our, in our, in our, at our trade, but there are a lot of young people growing up observing and trying to learn what does design truly mean and this is still what we do today uh, we're still trying to find ways of connecting with the next generation of designers um, and Dita Rams and, and Oliver Gravis the head of design and myself have spoken many times about this that education needs to upgrade like how do you educate someone in this field of design for, to actually have a solid understanding of what the future needs and not just over styled more spectacular things um, there's a great quote from from Dita actually we got couple of years ago, the world doesn't need more spectacular things, it needs simply truly better things. And, and I, I like that, that, that way of thinking about things that, that some designers get celebrated for being overtly crazy and being very in your face, where actually the world doesn't need much more of that, that there's enough of that going on. Um, when we talk about design at Brown, it's, it's about a, a stance, a way of seeing the world, what we call a common DNA. And I like this slide, obviously you cannot see the individual products, but I think you get a feeling for the current program and the, the, the portfolio that Brown has. Working across various products, um, we need to make sure that the DNA does stay common because if you pick up a, a clock or a watch or a shave or an IPL product, they need to look and feel like a Brown object and, and, and also offer the, the great experience of, of um, being easy to use, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna, I can't, I mean, the, the idea of this quote is, is uh, even more meaningful, I think, during the last few weeks of being at home, stuck in my family life. The idea of change happening and, and happening at a rapid pace and everyone observing and seeing that change. And we need to make sure that design evolves with that. What's needed and what matters is constantly shifting. And Peter's got some great slides about what that change has meant in the past. And I love the thought of taking that as a reference for what can actually happen in the future. And while we're at the future, I think this is a great opportunity to also say uh, to your audience, Marcus, that since 1968, Brown has founded and, and, and run a design prize. It's the oldest uh, product design competition in the world and actually a very, very meaningful one. We don't uh, ask for any entry fees. It's simply we offer 75, I think 75 or 100,000 euros last time. It's a lot of money as a prize money to really challenge the design community out there to up, up their game and show the world what good design truly is. And again, that's an idea worth sharing. So if there's an audience uh, interested in finding out about the last Brown Prize, please just jump on the Instagram page. There's a good overview of the last Brown Prize. Um, and we're kicking off that in the next few months and I'll be in touch, Marcus, when it comes to promoting the Brown Prize uh, in, the, in the coming months. So that's, that's my slides. Again, I apologize, it took seven minutes instead of five, um, but I hope that it was all informative and, and useful to, to hear. No, it was great, and there was no rush. That I, I didn't, I didn't want to point it out earlier in case you went on for fifty minutes. But the five-minute thing was just a, an indication to keep it relative. Oh, cool. But uh, I noticed you were talking about Brown being founded in 1921, so that means that next year is your centenary. So, what's the plan? What a great segue! Um, and I didn't even ask you to say that, which is a very, very authentic thing. Um, the centenary, the centenary is very exciting, to be honest, Marcus. Um, we uh, we're, we're talking with a lot of amazing humans right now. We're, we're really kicking off a few events and things, which I'm very excited to, uh, about. Um, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I've just lost you. I'm, I'm not sure. There we go. Let me come back to this window. Um, so centenary, centenary is really not about celebrating the past or even the present. It's actually looking forward. So the idea of it is actually forward looking, very much looking towards the future of what world do we want to live in? Uh, and, and what lessons can we take from the past and, and apply to, to, to the way we want to, to, to evolve in, in the sense of what design means in the future. Um, and even people like Peter, uh, we're working quite intensively together, had some very constructive discussions with Gary, even after your, your talk with him a few weeks ago, we jumped on the messenger and said, hey Gary, um, really enjoyed your talk. You said two or three things, which is really interesting. And we'd love to con continue that dialogue with you. So really looking to sort of extend the reach a bit, Marcus. And if you've got any suggestions of how to not just reach a design community, again, the people who have already got the knowledge and the understanding of what design is, but actually looking to reach more of those people who've got no idea, or maybe even just to turn our chair and say, hey guys, this is really interesting. Would you like to come and learn some more? That's a very, very powerful idea. And I'm looking forward to that coming, 
coming uh, to fruition over the next 15 months. Cool. I'll let you know if I have any ideas. <laughs> Please do. You're talking about that moment in 1955 when the whole approach shifted. Um, where did that come from? Where, where did that idea, you, you talked about the, 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 the sons or the brothers saying, shall we stick with this kind of Art Deco-ish wooden look or shall we go for something modern? But where did that come from and, and how did they settle on the aesthetic? It's a very succinct moment. And again, I, I welcome you to come to the uh, Brown Collection. We've got it all set up in like chronological order, but it's um, very much in line with the brothers Brown. Their father passed away very unexpectedly uh, in 1951. And they had a choice. They were both working at the company. One was more of a, an engineer. One was more of a marketing brain. So they're a very, very powerful combination. And they asked themselves a question together with a gentleman called Fritz Eichler, uh, actually one of, one of the most legendary thinkers at Brown at, at the time. And they had a three-way discussion sort of saying, do we continue down this path or what could the new path look like? And Fritz Eichler was actually a theater designer, like a stage uh, designer and engineer and a, and a cultural, I call him a cultural understander. He's, he's almost like the original hipster. He knows a lot about everything and, and he's very open to learn. And he guided the brothers Brown towards a small university uh, in a place called Ulm. Uh, and the Ulm school was one of those, if the Bauhaus had a child, if the Bauhaus had a love child with someone, and it would be called the Ulm school. And this Ulm school moment was, it was a chance for them to connect with the thinkers of tomorrow. So what does the future look like? And together with Ulm, uh, Hans Gugelo, uh, Fritz Eicher and the brothers Brown really put their heads together and actually did some user research. They went out to people's homes. They wrote letters to people. What would you like more of in your life, sir? They literally asked, they did a very traditional design process actually. What do you want more of in your life? How are you feeling? What, what are some of your aspirations? Where do you wanna go on holidays? Whatever the questions were to really get a feeling of what the time was like. And what were the aspirations of 10, 15 years that people were after? And they coined that in, in, in three products, um, which again is, is part of another, another, another talk, but they, they created three different objects uh, around those findings. And uh, it was about music in more places in the house. So music in the kitchen, the SK2, which uh, you saw, on my, I haven't got my slides, but that small radio, that's basically a kitchen radio. 50s, kitchen, good music, simple and easy to use, one hand, less buttons. Um, it was an embodiment of an object, which was a desire, a desired uh, user case. Um, and when it came to the living room spaces about Hans Gugelow was a, was a carpenter and his trade was building furniture. So he got, he put the vision on the table to say, instead of the radio being on a, pro, on a shelf or it being a massive, heavy, baker light, dark wooden, golden Art Deco box, could it be lighter? Could it be part of a system and establish like this individual block unit system uh, of, of units which work together as shelves, as sideboards, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the birth moment. Uh, William Wagenfeld uh, also designed an, another uh, another product. Uh, I don't have the images, I, I'd, I'd love to show you, but he also created an object which was a mobile music box, which is a record player and a radio. So they put three visions on the table, Marcus, and launched all three at the same time in 1955. Two were a big success. The record player was a bit of a very expensive experiment uh, and it wasn't that successful. But the market research you said, when they went to people and said, what do you want? It, sound, it sounds like they came back with functional information. We want a radio that can play in the kitchen. Did they also say, we want it to be white, silver, um, shiny? Did they, did they make aesthetic um, no, statements? It was, it was more about, I want to feel lighter. Mm. I don't right. want to be burdened. I want to feel free. I don't want to be cluttered. I don't want to be overwhelmed with everything that's going on. I want to feel clean and clear. So those buzzwords, all in, in English, they sound a bit strange, but in German, the, 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 the language they used was very, very aligned with decluttering. And we've, all, we've got the Marie Kondos of this world. We've got all these influencers saying, cleanse your space and things. They had the same aspirations back then. They were making choices to buy an object with their hard earned money, put it in the living space, and they wanted it to feel lighter. And that was, again, some of the key moments. It wasn't, again, no one sat down with a pen and said, I am going to now design a beautiful white box with little dots. It was, it was, a, it was a pragmatic, reducing this radio down to be as small as possible, as limited components as possible, and therefore an aesthetic was born out of that. 
Okay. And that's, I think, which a lot of people don't quite get about brown design. It's not an aesthetic. It's an approach, a way of doing things that leads to an object existing in a certain way. The Germans call it Hautung, just to put that word out there. If you want to write one down, Google it. There's no word for that in English. But it, basically, the design approach that Brown has is a Hautung. It's a way of doing things. It's a, a mindset. It's a set of, it's a, it's a, it's a very defined process. Um, so it's, uh, Hautung is, is a good word to describe what led to those objects being initially like they were. Mm. There was a, there's also a relationship between furniture and audio equipment, which this market research picked up on which recognized that, that a younger market was receptive to modern furniture in their living spaces. And because the, the enclosures for tube radios have to be large enough to allow air to circulate, they tend to be more on the scale of furniture. So they were very clever at Brown, realizing that if these younger audiences would accept modernist furniture, they would also except modernist radios because there's an overlap between the categories just on the basis of the scale of the objects. I think just to pick up again on something that Ben mentioned also about the, that moment, um, this sense of new time of a new, of a, of, you know, in German, you know, this, the, what is modern is the sense of new, the new, a new time. And, you know, following the war, this was a really, um, it was kind of important, sort of consciousness, really, a group way of thinking about, about what the present was. It was a new, a new beginning. Um, and th this, this design reflected that, mm. that, that way of thinking about the present as starting again. And what were the other electronics manufacturers doing at that time? Was Brown the first one? I mean, it kind of, in a way, it's like it, it adopted the language of modernism for yep. electronic products. Yep. And it's interesting you talked about furniture because that was going to be another, uh, my next question was that at that point, electronics, household electronics took on a modernist aesthetic, which they've kept ever since. Whereas furniture, some furniture is still modernist. A lot of furniture is still Victorian or yeah. pre-Victorian even. But um, in terms of electronic products, everything then went that way. They still yeah. look very much like that today. Yeah. But, uh, but at that time, how pioneering was Brown? Were there other, I don't know, general? <laughs> were, they, were they also doing this? Or were they if, you look, if you look at what Blaupunk, Grundig are doing at that time, it's, um, it's actually kind of woeful in relation to, it's the, it's the element of technology, which is so problematic. And um, it's as if they're scared, they're scared of it, and they need to disguise the object as being something else. So rather than a radio, you know, standing forward as a piece of electronics, as a device, it has to be hidden in a piece of nostalgic, backward looking furniture. Um, I, I guess it just becomes accepted gradually that um, audio equipment is electronics and that that's actually something to be celebrated and enjoyed. And then this kind of the technological appearance of those devices starts to be part of their marketing. Whereas before Brown, it was actually suppressed. So it's absolutely like groundbreaking in terms of the whole category, really. And that, that moment in time in 1955, uh, Marcus, was the year before they had a, a space, I think, 10 meters by four meters as, as a typical radio stand with like 50, 60 products, very overfilled, lots of logos. Yeah, and that's what everyone looked like, and all the products. Garlands of flowers. It had flowers and it had, yeah. it had all sorts of random details, and the products were very much engineering, engineered products. Like that radio, they were very much Baker-like. They were reddish, goldeny, detaily things. They were engineered, great technology, incredible to use, best function, but they all looked like everyone else. And this moment in time in 1955 was a stake in the ground. And the quotes in the financial times in financial times in Germany were right. Companies like Max Grundig literally saying the brothers Brown have ruined their father's company, <laughs> and that's like a statement in 1955. Might have felt good at the time, but literally two years later they started releasing also white boxes and products with a similar aesthetic. What they didn't copy though, Marcus, and this is again where I come back to my message and what I want to share. They didn't copy the the hotel. They didn't copy the way of developing the products. So needs easy to use and built to last. They dropped that one off because it's more expensive. It didn't need to be easy to use. Humans don't care anyway. Yes, it looks like it's useful, but it's actually not. 
So they missed out on actually copying what was essentially there for them to copy, and they only copied the aesthetic. And that's also uh, what many, many designers do very, very wrong. They, they look at the, the museums, and they, I, the reason I showed you those museum shots, because that's all people have in their mind, an object on a white shelf in the MoMA, but it doesn't tell you the actually thinking that led to that object existing in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way it does uh, today, or did then. And to, to lead into Peter's presentation, which is coming up very soon, I'll, I assure you, Peter, <laughs> that the theme of this talk is good design in times of change. So this 1955 was 10 years after the end of the, the Second World War. To what extent was it sort of a delayed reaction to the trauma of the war? What, what was the German psyche at that time? Did it take them 10 years to be ready for this big change in, in the domestic environment? Or what, what's the connection? I'm going to call my joker and, and let, let Peter answer. I mean, I, I could give you my rambling, but I think I've, my, I've got a timer how long I'm talking, how long Peter's yeah. talking. I'll let Peter answer that one. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are two sides to it. I mean, one is that um, it, I mean, as I was, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it kind of caught this, this, uh, this, this sort of moment of reconstruction of beginning again um, of um, not wanting to be ambivalent about technology um, but wanting to think about what of the potential, the world making potential, the really constructive, positive aspects of, 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 of what technology can achieve. Um, so there was that side of things. Uh, I think, you know, there is this, um, you know, that began in the, the late 1950s and then carried on in Germany through the 1960s, the, the so-called German economic miracle. Um, which was kind of exceptional in, in Europe in terms of its acceleration of development. Um, and I mean, there are people who speculate that part of the reason why German consumers were so ready for consumer capitalism was precisely because of the trauma of the war and losing themselves in consumerism was part of a, a kind of um, sort of social sort of suppression of the, of the trauma of, of the war. Um, and I mean, it has been argued that that wasn't very prob wasn't entirely useful actually in working through all of the all of those issues. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think um, in terms of 1955 with Brown, um, it was kind of it was at the the most positive kind of moment within that cycle. And towards the end of the 60s, um, it's where uh, I think socially things start to become more problematic in Europe generally, and things start to become unstable. And by the beginning of the seventies, they really start coming apart actually. So the, the sixties is like sort of a golden period in some ways. There's also, Pete, if I think about architecture and the role of architecture that period yeah. of time, again, look at, look at the buildings I'm sitting in right now. I'm literally sitting in a building from 1968, uh, modernist row house, terrace living, the, the, the aspiration of living better and having spaces and more people having homes and apartments and things. I think that was also the period of time that yeah. during the 50s it sort of, it had all started falling into place in the sense of how are we going to rebuild? Yeah, um, building there's that really interesting choice about whether, you know, you've got these, these cities which are completely flattened. So do you, do you rebuild them in the way that they were and reconstruct them literally, historically, or do you begin again and think, well, what, what could the city be like? And there was this sort of like strange, you know, you got this historicism and nostalgia, a fear of the future. And then I guess on the kind of like the other extreme is this kind of disaster of 60s urban town planning where they really did think that they were doing some fantastic work and, um, you know, stuck motorways through the centers of towns. Um, and, you know, there was a kind of an, a, rational, a rationality which wasn't entirely human in some ways, you know. Well, that happened in the UK as well, although we didn't have the, didn't have the, we got left behind in terms of the engineering side of things. And it's not, it's not time to discuss this right now, but it's interesting as well that the other European nation that rebuilt it, built itself through engineering design was, was Italy, but mm. in a very Southern European yeah. way, rather yeah. than a rationalist German way. But yeah. I think it's time to have a look at your presentation, Peter, because sure. you've babbled yeah. long enough now. <laughs> Uh, so can you all see that? Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay, so I, I'm going to start um, with a problem. <laughs> so this is uh, 
uh, this is Cologne um, in 1945 presenting itself as a bit of a problem. Um, it's been completely destroyed um, by the um, by the Second World War. Um, so just to sort of put ourselves back in this um, in this situation, um, it's um, I think it's both a kind of like an architectural physical catastrophe that Germany is facing and also um, a moral catastrophe um, because of their responsibility for the for the war and also for the for the for the Holocaust, which was um, you know an industrialized genocide. Um, so there is this um, ground zero, um, sort of um, big, complete um, fresh beginning, um, which is the, the condition um, in which a kind of uh, specific form of um, German model modernism finds itself post-war. Um, so this is, um, it's a cover of, of the Ulm School Journal, um, which was used as a, as a, as a prospectus, um, by the, by, the, by the school. Um, this was like the post-war successor to the Bauhaus. So um, there were instructors um, at Ulm who'd been, who'd been trained at the Bauhaus and it was part of the kind of self-consciousness of the school to align itself with the Bauhaus in certain ways, although they were quite keen to drop the kind of the crafts and arts aspect. It was much more focused on, it's like the, um, the Hans, um, the Maya phase, last, well, last but one phase of the Bauhaus. So it's um, focus on, um, on industrialized systems um, and the designer's role within teams rather than thinking of the designer as an artist. So the Ulm the supplied the, 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 the blueprint, I guess, essentially for brand design. Brand went to, to Ulm um, in 54. Um, and Otto Eicher, Hans Gugelo were responsible for really reconceiving um, the Brown program, both visually and at the level of, um, of, of product. Um, I just wanted, to, um, I was gonna um, say a couple of things about this because it's, it's kind of interesting and it's extreme modernism. Um, it's, it's very, very severe, very strict. Um, it's very controlled. Um, there's um, two sizes of type, two weights of type, uh, a very, very strict uh, four column grid. And these two levels of information, the typographic and the photographic are kind of very interestingly um, kind of enmeshed um, in a way which I think is really interesting. There's a kind of a random element which appears in this, this photograph of the Ulm School, which is just about which, 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 which lights are on in which rooms. And there's a sort of strange random element in the, um, the first column of the grid, which is not populated. And I think the, the interplay of these two somewhat inexplicable um, elements with the extreme rationality is for me, it kind of crystallizes what Ulm design is. And this got transferred also into Braun. Um, it's to do with a certain rigidity, a certain rule following, and at the same time, um, an element of freedom. It's extremely human. Um, whilst not appearing to you. Um, I just want to mention something which, um, which Adorno, um, a philosopher um, said about, uh, it's actually he was talking about German functionalist architecture. Um, and he says, architecture whether of human beings thinks better of men than they actually are. It views them in the way they could be according to the status of their own productive energies as embodied in technology, which is a bit of a mouthful, but th this idea of, um, of productive energies being a potential, which is disclosed by architecture, or it could be by product design, or it could be graphic design. It's something which is kind of a, a, an image, um, not, an image of the future, essentially. Um, it's, it's an image of human possibility, which I think is really um, sort of extraordinary and wonderful. Um, so if this is a problem, um, then in some ways the, um, the Ulm School is providing, um, it's providing concrete solutions to problems of how to organize different kinds of information, but it's also providing speculative future projecting solutions for how human beings could organize themselves, how they could be in the future. Um, this is, as Ben was, um, Ben's already showed in a slide of this, this is the, the D55, I think this is not actually at Dusseldorf in 1955 because the 
the, the audio equipment looks like it's a little bit later. So it's probably more like 1958. But this is, I mean, like unheard of in terms of how a brand might display itself and its products. This is a, a world that you enter, it's completely self-enclosed, it's completely rational, completely modular, flexible, in principle, infinitely extendable. And the products themselves sort of fall into a similar, similar system. Um, it's ex extremely rational, but everything is, is useful and human oriented. Um, I think, yeah, that's something really um, extraordinary about that. Um, but this is a view of the, of the Brown program, 1962. Um, again, it's thinking, of, I think about this in a similar way to that cover of the, of the Ulm journal um, as, I, I mean, on the one hand, um, very useful, very functional, very, very rigorously defined objects, which you intuitively know how to use. Um, and in that sense, um, very modernist. But I mean, in a weirder way, I guess, also this is um, a picture of, a, it's a sort of a utopian proposal for the possible form of social life. These are like people almost. Like this is how you can have um, a social form, like a whole, which is the way there's a, 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 a unity of difference within an overarching unity. So it's the possibility of both freedom and law. It's the possibility of rationality, um, which is slightly different from the kind of uh, rationality of calculation. It's, it's a rationality of um, a certain rational response to human need. And it's the condition of actually being human, of being fully human, rather than just being human beings kind of scraping around in the mud, which in some ways we are still. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to, I'm going to end on this, um, just to say that I think there's something really interesting about looking at this now, because we're looking back at a moment which is projecting forward. And it, it's, it's, it says something about the, the oddness of our own position. Like this is, this is a resource for us in thinking about our future. So in some ways we're, sim we're in a similar position to, to Germany in the 1960s. But what we need to avoid in looking back in order to look forward is nostalgia, which is useless. It's a comfort. It's like getting under a duvet, but it does nothing really. So it's to avoid nostalgia, but also avoid like thinking futuristically about the future. You know, so like, I'm thinking about, I don't want to be too critical, but designers maybe like Karim Rashid who, who produce, um, a, a very expressive futuristic vision of the future, which I think is maybe not as useful as uh, a future oriented vision, you know, like this program is. So I guess that, that's where I, where, where I would want to end is um, thinking about the past as a, as a resource, as, some, as, a, as somewhere where we can kind of reach back and retrieve something, but then how and what then becomes, I guess, the question. Thanks. Peter, yeah. could you unshare your screen? Yeah. Briefly. Am I so, back? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, clearly the, the set of objects you just showed is not nostalgic, but are you sure it wasn't futuristic? Because in 1955, mm -hmm. what, surely that did sort of preempt the space age. There was a tremendous optimism. There were movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, trade, the world expos, where it, it did seem like it was futurist. It was like, wow, yeah. we live like this. Absolutely, yeah. But it, I think there are different ways of being sort of future oriented. You know, you, you can, you could, um, so this is, uh, this is, this is f future, future oriented in the sense that it was, no one had seen anything like it. So now it looks familiar because, you know, it, because in that intervening period, kind of everyone else has caught up we've been habituated to it and it's just become the way that things look. At the time, it was absolutely shocking, you know, really um, extraordinarily new. And in the audio category, it was too new and actually didn't do particularly well in the market because people weren't really ready for it. So it was more a kind of a, a proposal that was exciting, but somewhat unacceptable. The, this household stuff, um, 
it's yeah it, it is it's new and it's it's living in there's an excitement about how we could be living and in that sense it's futuristic but i think what's maybe there are more, a more negative form of being futuristic is kind of is to fetishize the idea of the not now of something of something of something ahead something something to come and the connection between the past and the present like what you need to do now to get to that has kind of broken and instead you've got a kind of a glamorous sense of the future which becomes a sort of self-contained aesthetic and that i mean it's i don't know how interesting that is really it's kind of yeah you <laughs> said that's the tail fin version of the future isn't it it's a you, mere styling form of futurism you said that some of the products were not successful but so we, we kind of think about that that era of products as being a tremendous success but and yeah. I kind of was going to ask earlier that, you know, what, to what degree was it accepted by people? But was well, it the, all of the, house, the household equipment was. So, you know, everything that I showed in that slide was. Um, the, the, what really people struggled with were the, um, I mean, some of Dieter Ram's um, audio equipments was particularly the, the higher end um, modular hi-fi systems, particularly like, for example, the wall mounted system um, is really challenging. It's still pretty challenging. Um, and I think maybe I, it was I can, some architect. Yeah, this thing. This, <laughs> but it's like a ribbon of technology. It's really naked and um, it's not going to work for everyone, you know, even I think today it would be, it's, it's, not, it's, quite, it's an acquired taste, I would say. But at the time it, it, was, uh, it was a brand building exercise. So, you know, they, I think Brown considered it important to do it, um, less important that it was phenomenally successful. It was more a, it was more a proposition in some ways, you know, like this is, this is what can be done. This is what can be done. Not the market's ready for it. You know? yeah. And again, back to our theme, good design in, in times of change. Are there any other historic examples where similar things have happened, where there's been a, a, a major societal trauma or um, a, a big change that has then had a response in design that has become, created a legacy? I, don't know. I, mean, I, I would touch on Peter if you if you if you if you don't mind, I'll sort of kick off the, the thought. But like, if you look at the fifties and sixties, glory days, wall units, hi-fi, we're pushing the boundaries. Architects love us. Domus, every every publication is talking about this idea of this is the future. This is the way we all should be striving to live. Um, and then there's the seventies of the oil crisis and the period of time where all those resources to make these things, the idea of plastic and materials and, 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 and resources being everywhere and, and being almost abundant, that was gone. And it, it almost <clears throat> forced a, a refinement, I like to call it, of, of, the, of the founding years, Brothers Brown, Aisha, Gugilo, Rams joining the party and everyone getting, getting really, we're doing this amazing thing. It was almost like, oh, we even need to pull the reins even tighter if we want to have a future. And, and Pete, I mean, if you've got any thoughts on that, but I think that, yeah. you know, let's, let's touch on that briefly because that's quite an interesting moment in time because uh, it's actually similar to what we're going through right now, Marcus. Sparse resources, climate change, forget the, the, the COVID situation, but the, the, the idea of the world changing and not having abundant and, and, and non, um, yeah, yeah, utopian visions of having everything we need forever. It's, it's not the case. So yeah. the 70s is one of those moments in time. I, I, think. I think there are different, there are different levels and different kinds of trauma. Um, and maybe, maybe the Second World War is kind of, um, and maybe there is a relationship between the universality of COVID, it's truly a global phenomenon, yes. and the Second World War, it was a world war, right? So there is a kind of a, an interesting equivalence of exposure to that, which is a shared experience. This is one of the first, just to be positive about COVID, it's probably the only way you could be. It's actually a shared experience at the level of the planet. Um, the, the tendency of globalization is actually not towards shared experiences. So even though everyone is increasingly bound together and interdependent, which COVID has also shown, um, the experience of that is not shared, it's not common. It's actually the opposite. It's quite um, um, disjunctive. So, and I think that it, since the Second World War, that's the, the kinds of traumas that people have gone through, if you like, 
um, have varied from place to place and also from time to time. So it's difficult to find a comparison to the, to the Second World War. But I, I kind of think like the internet has been a trauma and has impacted on design significantly. Like the, the, this kind of um, new form of, of work, new form of personal relations, new forms of communication and experience, the, the, the prevalence of um, social media in its forming of outlooks, um, it's huge. And it's really, um, it's, I think, I mean, I've, I've noticed this certainly within, within design, it's created a, a drive towards objects, which is kind of counterintuitive. You'd think actually we'd all be moving away from them, but it's created a need for material. Um, sometimes that becomes hysterical and then you get this fetishism of experience and immediate things and a kind of weird connoisseurship of, uh, of, a, of one's own experience, which is very <laughs> weird and distanced and immediate at the same time. You see that in um, the return um, to some of the tropes of brand design from the 60s and now, you know, with the use of leather, leather handles, for example. It's, it's only because of the internet in some ways that you would need your device to have those tangible kind of elements that, that show patina, for example. It started to become ingrained dirt has started to become attractive because of the internet. It's kind of odd, but so that's those kinds of traumas are weaker, but I think they they do register still in design. Well, and what about the current tra trauma of coronavirus then? Because yeah. that's actually made, for the time being at least, the whole notion of tactility a hygiene risk. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, the pages of Design over the last two months have been full of yeah. architects and designers speculating about what the objects yeah. of the post corona objects might be the post corona yeah. public spaces and architecture and so on and so forth but this has the potential as you said to be the next global trauma of course there's been terrible famines and wars in the yeah. intervening years since 1955 but it's, it feels like this is the the follow up to world war 2 in a way in terms yeah. of global impact so do you have any thoughts about already about what will emerge from from this time in terms of design or is it too early to tell? So, uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I kind of feel like it's, um, it's going to become, I mean, I think you're right. There will, there will be obvious, um, there'll, be high, there'll, be, there'll be measures that are, that are driven by hygiene considerations, certainly, which will be to do with minimizing handling. Um, but I kind of feel like it's going to, that the whole, the, the, the whole of the, the, the effect of COVID in terms of development will just accelerate already existing trends or just be an amplification. So um, there's already a kind of um, a, a tendency towards frictionlessness, whether that's increasingly through experience mediated by screens or moving from cell to cell, whether it's from a room to an Uber, to an atrium, to, a, to another room. Um, I, I kind of feel like that will, there's a, in, in some ways that's not true and that just discloses all the material, the dirt, if you like, that gets, that's concealed under all those transactions, but certainly the desire for that, I could see getting greater. Uh, how, uh, but then there needs to be that other side as well, which has the, so I, that's the thing that I'm not sure how that will work, you know, where that, where the compensation for that will occur, because I, I think it will be intolerable to live exclusively like that. And there's also just um, a, a, a simple material consideration that um, not everyone will be able to arrange their lives that way. It, it, won't, it, won't, be a, it won't be an option for them. So it, it, can be a, it can be a design option for people that can afford to do that. Um, that's also a, an issue and a problem. Benjamin, slight change of topic, but um, as someone who works at Brown, which is, 99 years old now, has this kind of astonishing legacy. That must be quite hard to deal with. I mean, how do you, how do you, as a company, how do you, does the legacy become a burden at any point? Does it sort of box you in? When, when in a changing world, do you feel like you have to adhere to that legacy or abandon it or do something that is, is equally disruptive There was a moment in time 10 years ago when, when Oliver Gravis took over as a head of, head of design uh, of, of Brown. 
And a lot of that, that question, we, the, the, the small design team in Kronberg asked themselves and spent months literally talking about exactly that topic. What do we, what do we want to take forward? What do we leave behind? What's, where have we been in the last period of time? What's, what is future relevant? And how do we want to evolve things? In my, in my slides, I used the word evolved a couple of times. It's certainly not a burden. It's more of a, a place of inspiration. I mean, I go sometimes to our archive with a problem or I've got an idea or a story I'm, I'm trying to talk about. We're talking a lot about simplicity and usefulness these days. The idea of one button, the idea of one button. You might be thinking, well, one button, their phones, they're even taking the buttons away. But that one button on an object that's to be used can be very, very important. And that's something which is historically in our genes. That goes right back to when Max Brown was making the first few products and making a handle with just one switch to, to make light, a manual uh, device. I, the design team and myself, we, we, we're always trying to look forward without just staring back the whole time. Because you can you glance in the rearview mirror, but certainly look, look forward and, and, and take the parts uh, with you that, that are most relevant. And the most relevant ones are the three points I mentioned before. If you make something which is useful, but a human needs, make sure it's easy to use it, anyone can do it, and make sure it's built to last. It's a pretty good recipe for designing a better future that many, many companies could cut a big chunk out of. Um, and that's sort of the way that we're trying to simplify things. I mean, Dieter's 10 principles, everyone knows them. Um, but for a person walking down Regent Street, an 18 year old who's looking at their phone, Instagramming, what, what does that even mean? So that's why we're really trying to find ways of making it more accessible. If something is easy to use, that's by design, it's intentional. That's foundational thinking of the last hundred years. Yeah. Uh, and again, when you do get a chance to come to Kronberg, I'll show you exactly the first product we made, um, which was uh, again, found on need, easy to do, and was built to last. It still works today. The machine that Max Brown built to join leather belts in 1921. Yeah. Um, so that's- that, that, is, that is the tradition. Exactly. So it's not that, that it's not like um, Brown would be trapped in a tradition of making things look a certain way, like a stylistic tradition. The tradition is of addressing need directly now in the present. So in, in that way, there's no, there's no constraint or burden in relation to the past. It's just about thinking, well, what does it, what does it need to do now? It's, it's a very, very powerful thing, Marcus. And, and, and the design team, um, myself inclusive, love doing this in meetings. If the engineers, the R&Ds, the people, the, the business teams are getting active and very excited and things start getting a bit in, like, I'm gonna call it interesting or they start adding things on which are really superfluous. That moment of subtraction say, look guys, is this really the direction we want to go down? Cause it's gonna to lead to this, this and this. It's gonna become more fragile. It's another, another part we have to manufacture. Uh, it's another place where water can get inside. You start to use the tools of the last hundred years against that small team of eight, nine te technicians. I love the technical team like you wouldn't believe. Brown would be nothing without the technology. But if you would put that equation of, of humans, technology teams and design, that, that, that back and forth of what's really, really necessary, that level of subtraction say, look, let's move forward with this direction because it's actually taking away these three parts and it will become better for that reason. Yeah. Um, that's so powerful. And that, that's sort of, again, why part of my job in my role now is actually talking. And uh, I know I'm talking a lot again, but I guess that's part of my role. <laughs> the, the idea of sharing that understanding, Marcus, even with the next generation of, of, of brand members who are coming through the teams, and I'm working with, with Veronica, one of my, my partners in Geneva, and we've had the most incredible 12 months working on this 100 years of Brown, really getting down to what the essence is and how do we connect with our current products, the past, the way of thinking and the way of doing things, which is ridiculously important for a better future. Uh, and that's... that's uh... it, it can also be that, that, that new conditions make old approaches, sort of renew older, older approaches. So, you know, there's a, obviously there's a, there's a, a current environmental crisis, which is global and making things well, which last longer that's they've Brown have always done that. They've always made, they've always given value for money and produced durable goods that don't fail on you. Now that's, that's acquired a new significance. It's now become a pr urgent, a pressing need that things are built that way. And so, the, other, the other need, Peter, is you mentioned before, the idea of connectedness, Mar Marcus and Peter, and the idea of internet and, and the role of, of all these things. 
There's a reason why the design team, together with our audio partners, decided to put literally a manual, mechanical, literally a separation of electronics, microphone uh, switch, like a mute button, on the new audio products. It wasn't because we like, like mechanical buttons, it's because it's, a, it's an actual need of the current state that we are living in that I want, if I want to buy a pool, I talk about it for five minutes, 10 minutes later, my phone starts suggesting buying a pool. That's the world we live in. So Brown's solution to that, in the form of our tradition, we installed a, a mechanical button. Gregor Petok, the head designer of that, did an amazing job with, with, with including that as a simple feature, but it's a pretty important one. Yeah, and, uh, it's yeah. also really nice that that, uh, that that kind of disconnection from the internet is is mechanical. It, it's a it's a physical break, which yeah. is, which is nice. Final question, and it's a bit of a philosophical one. We've also slightly covered it, but it was interesting just now, Benjamin. You said about um, when things went from one button, which was a step from multiple buttons, and now we're in an era of no buttons, mm -hmm. and uh, the coronavirus has also thrown up a lot of talk about touchless things where you you don't have to gesture controlled or sensor controlled or whatever and and so much of the 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 kind of the cutting edge of, of what's happening in the design world now is, is really invisible it's it's ai it's vr it's it's stuff that you can't actually hold so what is the role of the object in this time i mean we talked about tactility yes materials and so on and so forth but where how how do objects functional objects remain um, relevant at a time when it's all disappearing into the cloud? I think it's going to be a very, very interesting journey over the next few years. I mean, we could, we could make a shaver that you could start with your voice 10 years ago. We, we could make a coffee machine you could talk to and it'll make you make your coffee and all, or there will be a, an evolution of which objects I choose and want to touch and interact with. I mean, my favorite coffee cup or, or I've got a, I got this from my, 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 my uh, I think my, 30, my 30th birthday or something, I wrote this cup and I'm still using it 10 years later. It's my favorite cup. Um, there will be choices that are made even on the, from a design standpoint, but from a societal standpoint, what objects do I want to keep in my life which provide and add value? And that's a great segue actually to, to the topic that Ilza, I mean, you're talking with Ilza Crawford this afternoon. And that's all about the choices we make to integrate things into our life. And, and if you choose to add uh, something with a button or something with a, with a favorite handle or, or an object you, you want to interact with, that's a, going to be a choice. And I think some of the superfluous things will also, in true sense, life will become a bit less but better because they'll start to waver away. Things that don't need physical buttons, things you don't need to touch, they will start to go into the background. Um, and that's again, thank you Dita for the quote, but Dita was quoted during the 60s saying that brown design and good design is like an English butler. It is there when you need it, but actually in the background when you don't. And that's sort of, I think the evolution that we're gonna see here is more and more of that taking place. Of things that bother you, you're annoyed about, things that are breaking, superfluous things, they will start to disappear more and more, I believe. I hope, because that's actually a stronger and a more enjoyable future than still this additive, creative, some of the junk that's being produced these days doesn't need to exist. And uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully that actually happening. Yeah. Give, me, give me an idea, actually. You talked about your, your mug and um, touchless door handles and things like that. Maybe if everyone had their own handle, they just carried a handle around. <laughs> There's actually, yeah. I saw that recently on Yanko or something. Someone made that on Yanko, like one of the, one of the, 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 the Render Weekly's competitions like that, they, they did that and they had like the one handle to do things. It was uh, a bit weird, but kind of cool. But you're, you're innovative, man, you're innovative. What were you gonna say, Peter? No, I, I was just um, thinking about the necessity of objects in some ways. Um, I think that there, that there was this kind of early internet fantasy that, that the material world would be transcended and we'd all be transported to this kind of spiritual realm of kind of somehow dealing with pure information. And I, I think that actually we really need objects, kind of we need to see ourselves, kind of to find ourselves. We need, we need to do that through objects. It's not necessarily through the consumption of objects, but through the creation and through the use of objects. Um, I think that without that, we're just going to be blown around in the wind. But this idea of um, isolation and social distance, for me, it's already there in the internet. It's just, it's just made that some suddenly more present and more intense. 
it's almost like the internet uh, has kind of like appeared in the physical world and it's like suddenly sort of erupted in this really kind of um, frightening, frightening form. So I, I wouldn't, I think, we, I don't think we can do without objects. I think it's like the, the issue is how, which objects we use and how. No, so my, 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 my build also, Pete, to say the objects we have, again, I am the biggest opposer of anything to do with single use, single use forks, single use plates, single use anything. Mm. The objects have a value. They've been, the, the material has been dug out of the ground, shipped over the world, inject, injection molded into a piece of steel, then transported in a plastic bag to another country and is used for 25 seconds and thrown away. That, that distance of, 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 to the objects and to the meaning of these things that have been produced with these incredible materials, that's also a gap, Marcus, which I think we're talking about things getting more further apart. And these are some of the, the gaps I think we should all start to close as well in relation to the decisions we make and how we live. Um, because there's a lot of waste uh, stuff out there and people have lost the connection with where objects come from and what they actually, the design object actually, for a value it actually has. Yeah. Um, well, guys, Benjamin, Peter, thanks so much. It's been a fascinating conversation. Yeah. been the well, longest, the longest talk we've done so far. A, is that a good thing? Hold on, is that, is that <laughs> a good thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm starving now. I've got to go and get some, some lunch before the talk <laughs> talks are at four. But thanks very much. Thanks to Brown for arranging this series of talks. And I'll see you all later at four o'clock when I'll be talking to Ilsa Crawford. You'll be talking to Ilsa. Thank you very much. Take care. All the best. Thank, Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye.